Um, David will be presenting on optical dissolved oxygen technology, uh, providing a history of this technology and a look at what can be expected in the future. Um, it's a, what subject that interests me, so carry on, David. Thank you very much. Wow, graveyard shift. Thank you very much for actually turning up. I'll try and get this through as quickly as possible. My name's Dave. I'm uh, the sales manager of the UK and Ireland with in situ, uh, Waterra in situ, as we're currently known here in the UK. Today's presentation is a quick overview on optical dissolved oxygen. Um, I'm going to run through a bit of a history behind dissolved oxygen measurements, some of the traditional ideas, a look at how optical measurements work, um, some of the challenges they faced in the early development stages and how or if these obstacles have been overcome. Most of you, I'm hoping, are involved at some level in dissolved oxygen monitoring. Uh, anyone who deals with water almost at any level is going to be interested in the amount of oxygen uh, involved. This just gives you a, a brief idea of the kind of businesses that we deal with. There are originally two methods for measuring uh, dissolved oxygen. There's a uh, Winkler titration method. So a lab-based method for measuring dissolved oxygen obviously comes with uh, various restrictions. And then there's an electrochemical sensor developed in the 1950s, uh, commonly known as the Clark cell or a polyographic galvanic cell. Um, both of these methods have been used widely up until sort of mid-2006. The Winkler titration method, if anyone's interested, the calculation or the chemical formula for it is all there. It has to be done in a lab, your samples have to be taken, so it's not a, it's not a real time measurement, uh, it's not a spot measurement, it'll take you a couple of days to get the results back. Your electrochemical dissolved oxygen sensors are the most commonly used version of DO sensors in the market today. They principally work by having an anode and a cathode in a, held in a cap which has an electrolyte solution and a membrane on the front. This cap screwed over your anode and cathode. Dissolved oxygen passes through the membrane into the electrolyte solution and generates an electrical current. This current is directly proportional to the amount of oxygen present in the solution. They have a few issues with them. Because they actually absorb dissolved oxygen across the membrane, if you have a very low flow or stagnant water pool, you will eventually get a zero oxygen reading as the oxygen in front of the sensor is used up completely. The electrical reaction also creates a silver bromide deposit uh, on the sensor face. So electrical chemical sensors need, they need stirring, they need cleaning, and they need replacement of the electrolyte within the sensor in order to keep them running. So there's quite a high maintenance cost behind them. So long-term deployment becomes difficult. The membranes on the front of them are also quite delicate. Uh, ser serious abrasion, any sediment in the water flows, things like that, will gunk up, block, and degrade the membrane uh, on the front. So while a useful way of taking spot dissolved oxygen measurement samples, long-term monitoring and deployment with these sort of sensors becomes difficult. They become expensive to maintain and increase your staff costings. The optical sensors, a quick overview behind them. Effectively, what you do is you remove your anode and cathode. You replace your membrane on the front with a luminescence foil. There's no electrolyte in this cap. This luminescent foil is made up of a combination of polymers, effectively. The way these sensors work, oh, I, I thought I had a different slide then. The way these sensors work is that by shining uh, or by activating that luminophore, so shining blue light onto the underside, that energy from the light is transferred into kinetic energy in the molecules of the foil. If there's no oxygen present on the other side of the foil, that kinetic energy is transferred and emitted as red light back to a receptor in the sensor. If there are molecules of oxygen present on the other side, that kinetic energy is transferred to the oxygen molecules and dissipated into the solution. It means that your red light receptor within the sensor doesn't receive back as much as it was expecting. By using a few algorithms, the sensor will then give you a, uh, a calculation and tell you how much dissolved oxygen is present on the other side of that sensor. It's an improportional, revert, it's an improportional relationship. So optical dissolved oxygen sensors are much more accurate at low dissolved oxygen sensors. They're at their most responsive at 0%. It's also, it doesn't use oxygen up. None of this oxygen is actually transmitted across the membrane. Energy is simply transferred 
from the foil to the oxygen solution. This means that even if you leave it in stagnant and still water, you're still going to get a very, very stable response. There won't be any degradation uh, of the reading over time. So your key, your key advantages for your optical dissolved oxygen over the traditional galvanic and polyographic, you don't need a flow, so you don't need to stir the sample. The polymer foils you have on the front of the sensor caps are much, much more abrasion resistant than the membranes on traditional Clark cells. So you can use them in particularly harsh environments, chemicals, we use them quite heavily in bioremediation in groundwater systems. Abrasion isn't a problem in silt laden waters in wastewater treatment plants. You get, uh, you get a very, very stable reading at low dissolved oxygen for them. So if you've ever used galvanic or polygraphic sensors, you'll know they're quite difficult to calibrate at a zero oxygen point. This graph just gives you, or the next couple of graphs, gives you a quick idea of the results. The pink line you can see is the optical sensor. The blue line is the Clark cell. This graph shows the flow being turned off on a sample. Almost as soon as the flow is stopped, you start to see a drop in the dissolved oxygen in front of a Clark cell as the oxygen molecules in front of it are absorbed across the membrane. And if we actually left the flow off on this test, you would eventually see it drop to zero uh, over time. Whereas the optical sensors won't. They, they don't absorb any of the dissolved oxygen in the solution in front of them. This gives you an idea of the sort of stability you can expect from an optical sensor against what I have to admit looks like a pretty bad Clark cell sensor. Um, the pink line, as you see I'm running underneath the bottom, is the optical dissolved oxygen. The blue line is the Clark cell. I suspect this was a, a sales and marketing tool. And again, at 100%, it's not quite such a pronounced stability difference. The Clark cells, because of their proportional relationship, the more oxygen in the solution, the higher the voltage the cell has to measure it does pick up 100% much more effectively than it does at 0%. But the optical sensors still perform uh, much more stably, uh, even at this end of the spectrum. With any uh, Clark cell or galvanic sensor, there's a, a warm-up time. You need some oxygen to move across the sensor. You need it to create an electrical current within the electrolyte. Uh, you need the sensor to pick this up. So they have a warm-up time. Again, it's not the case with an optical sensor sensors will start working as soon as they're powered up. Just to give you a rough history uh, on the optical dissolved oxygen, so we had Winkler titrations from about 1880. 1950 saw the introduction of the Clark cells. It wasn't until the early 2000s that people started experimenting heavily with optical sensors. They were mainly driven from medical research uh, and in some of the more uh, I suppose high capital industries such as the marine environment where optical dissolved oxygen and long-term sensor life was crucial. Uh, Mid-2000s, 2006 saw the introduction of these sensors onto mainstream multi-parameter and handheld water quality systems. Uh, and the developments carry on uh, today. A quick plug for our particular RDO sensor in situ manufacture one that is uh, approved by the EPA in the US and uh, all of the various technical documents can be found uh, on the website. Some of the challenges that uh, they faced over when producing optical dissolved oxygen sensors. The original units had a very, very high power consumption, uh, driving the LEDs and driving the electronics within them. They were also much, much more expensive. Uh, three and a half thousand pounds for some of the first, very early versions of the optical sensors. And abrasion. These days, the polymer abrasions on the front are very, very resistant. But to begin with, it was difficult to create a set of polymer layers that were both responsive enough to pick up small changes in dissolved oxygen concentrations, but also withstand uh, the sort of environments that these sensors are often used in. There was an issue with uh, hydration. The sensors needed to be kept moist uh, to avoid drying out of the layers between and, and appealing of the sensors. And they also, as if you, no, they also had issues with UV interference. Ultraviolet light would break up and degrade the foils. Um, the other issue with, dissolved op with optical sensors is that foil batch uh, that sticks across the front of the membrane is they're made in huge sheets and uh, small sections are cut out. 
Every single one of those sheets that's made is ever so slightly different in thickness, reacts ever so slightly differently, and so has an individual coefficient. And how to, how to program that coefficient into a sensor that you're currently using uh, was a real challenge. The first sensors used to come with strings of uh, a sheet of paper with a coefficient code that you had to manually program into your sensor if you ever replaced uh, the foil system on the front. Fine. Where are we now? So today the sensors draw as little as 100 milliamps uh, while reading. Uh, so 100 milliamps for maybe a couple of seconds, less than 100 microamps when they're in sleep mode, drawing very, very little power, allowing long-term deployment on, uh, on remote sensor systems. You can typically find optical sensors themselves for less than 800 pounds. Uh, so we've come down in, uh, quite dramatically in, uh, in less than five or six years. The abrasion resistance has increased. We found new, new polymers, new polymer combinations we can put together to give us an abrasion resistant finish on the top. We no longer have issues with hydration or UV photo bleaching. And the foil coefficients are stored within a small chip which is actually on the inside of the sensor cap itself. So when you plug it onto your sensor, those coefficients are loaded automatically, reducing any level of user error when reprogramming. This is an idea of what used to happen and still does on some sensors with, a, with abrasion. This is what happens if you sandblast them for 45 seconds. Again, an issue with uh, abrasion wiper systems are often used uh, to clean sensors out. One of the problems, again, is that if you're not careful, you'll abrade the foil straight off the top if you get sand and grit caught in a wiper system. So the conclusions for me on optical DO are that it's, uh, it is a stable and recommended replacement for galvanic systems, systems, but not all of your optical sensors are the same. There are several different manufacturers, and there are a set of questions that need to be asked every time. How are the coefficients managed? Are they on a chip or are they still on a, a long ream of paper that's individual to every cap you buy? What's the power consumption? How abrasion resistant are the foils you're looking at? What kind of environment are you using them in? And does it require any hydration or is it affected by UV photo bleaching? It has overtaken galvanic sensors. It is a sensible replacement. They're not all the same. But if you look hard enough and ask the right questions, you'll find a sensor that suits your application. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Right, so um, do we have any um, questions from the floor for either Anna or David regarding the uh, two presentations we've just had? Um, yes, we have. One over there first. Hi, I'm Phil Roberts from Sharp's R&D Labs in Europe. Um, there's a question to Anna about the ASV. Um, yeah. Do you think it can ever be reduced down to the size and cost of a, for a consumer device? That we've all got one in our, in our own house. Um, you should never say never. <laughs> now, we're, we're looking to, to reduce the size of ours. And it's something that, we, that we're continuously working on to make it smaller and um, and cheaper, of course. Yeah. Hi, uh, Karen Clo from High Utilities. I just have a question for David. So, yeah, could you um, say so your name and your um, affiliation? Yes, Karen Clo from Our Utilities. Uh, I just have a question about the cleaning mechanism. I mean, would you, do you think it should be cleaning or? Do you think they shouldn't be cleaning? Because I know there's various different sort of thoughts on this, whether it's solids or polymer. Or yeah, it depends on the environment they're being put in. But if you have them in a particularly harsh, a particularly harsh environment for sludge or biological buildup, uh, you can use things like uh, copper shields, so a copper mesh around the outside, which still allows the water in but will kill any biological agents that build up around the front of the sensor. Or either we use air sparging. So a small air jet that sits over the front of the sensor and will routinely uh, blow out a stream of bubbles across it, uh, purging the area. The nice advantage of the air sparging method is you can also use it for calibration uh, verification. If you can let that jet of water run across it for long enough, you can uh, scope it at 100% uh, and check that your sensor is actually working, uh, working properly. 
I don't like wipers generally, but I also think that the way people design wipers are bad. Uh, they tend to use very soft, sort of a sponge-like material or a set of brushes and bristles which catch a lot of the sediment. Using something like a, a car windscreen wiper blade uh, is a much, much better method to uh, pull the sediment across rather than uh, abrade it across the front of the sensor face. You're right, there isn't really a, an industry standard for it. Uh, a lot of it just depends on the application. There are a lot of small innovative companies in the UK who have taken these sensors and put cleaning mechanisms on top of them. That's usually the best way to look for them. Any other questions? Um, I just have got a quick question for, um, for David. I mean, um, speed of response. I mean, I, I, I know that in the earlier versions of the dissolved oxygen sensors, um, they were quite slow. Where are they now and where are they heading to? Uh, for the optical dissolved oxygen sensors, typically you're looking at a reading less than, uh, less than 30 seconds in most sort of commercially available for the in natural environmental waters and wastewater treatment. Uh, some of the units for marine systems, uh, you can get sub 10 second intervals uh, and faster. Uh, my question always on the very, very fast sensors is how accurate and stable the reading is. Uh, you, can get a reading in, you can get a reading instantaneously. Uh, whether or not it's accurate is, a, is another question. Thank you very much. And one, uh, any, any, any other questions while I... One final question for Anna, and I think we'll wrap it up if there's no other, other questions. Um, um, the, um, I, I, did I miss it, or was there, is, 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 there was a photograph of the system. Um, are reagents required in that system, are they? Yes, uh, reagents are required, and uh, we manufacture them, for example, to ISO 9001 standards. Uh, you need uh, electrolytes, you need standards, you need other reagents to mix with the sample for the electrochemistry to work. And uh, it's important that the reagents are made with the ultra-pure water and ultra-pure ingredients. Well, I think that concludes our um, uh, seminar this afternoon, and I'd like to thank you all for attending.